Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. Over the past decade, the story of global greenhouse gas emissions has been one of significant reductions in the developed world, which has been more than offset by soaring growth in China, India, Indonesia, Southeast Asia and other emerging economies. My guest today has more detailed knowledge of energy and air quality in those countries and regions than anyone I know, painstakingly assembled from local language public sources. Lauri Milivirta is the co-founder and lead analyst at the Centre for Research on Energy and Clean Air, CREA, in Helsinki. Before we start, if you're enjoying cleaning up, please make sure that you like, subscribe and leave a review and tell all your friends about us. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favourite podcast platform and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram. Over the holidays, we moved the Cleaning Up newsletter to Substack, where you can find it on mlcleaningup.substack.com. That's mlcleaningup.substack.com. And don't forget, there are over 170 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders on cleaningup.live. That's cleaningup.live. One more thing before we get going. I'm also in the process of launching a brand new substack called The Thoughts of Chairman Michael. The aim is to create a single hub, bringing together all my written audio and video output. You'll find everything from links to my conference speeches and Bloomberg NEF columns, exclusive thought pieces on the transition, and miscellaneous blogs on stuff I've found interesting. I'll be posting new content regularly so make sure you subscribe. Search for The Thoughts of Chairman Michael on Substack, or if you can spell my name, go to emilybreich.substack.com. That's emilybreich.substack.com. See you there. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation. Please welcome Lauri Milaverta to Cleaning Up. So, Lowry, welcome to Cleaning Up. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Let's start the way we usually do, which is by asking you in your words to explain what is it that you do, the short version. Um, I currently run an organization called uh, Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air, which um, provides evidence, data, research to people around the world who are working for clean energy and for clean air. We cover China, um, India, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Europe, and we have a project looking at uh, Russia's exports of uh, fossil fuels and their contribution to the invasion of Ukraine. Okay, so now what we're going to do is to do a sort of flyby of those different areas. Um, And I think we should give a little bit of context, which is you and I met when you were Beijing based because um, you were running, uh, well, you were generating the most extraordinary research on China at the time. And um, you were using statistics and data that not many people could interpret. You speak um, Mandarin, Chinese, and um, your output was incredibly insightful. So the context here is that I suspect you've got important things to say about China, India, Indonesia, South Africa, Russia, and so on. So we're going to go through those different areas. Let's go back to when you and I met, though. Why were you in Beijing? How did you get there? Uh, When I started working on coal, so basically how do we transition the world away from coal? Um, Obviously, China uh, was a big uh, focus on that, and in that and it was a time back in uh, 2011, 2012, that um, air pollution has, had become a massive public issue in China. And I quickly found out that uh, uh, with the kind of uh, research data and, and modeling that I was able to do, I was able to contribute to the understanding that, that the people working on that issue um, had and, and to the public debate um, about that. Now, how did you end up learning to speak Chinese, though? Um, when I when I found out that there is something that I can well obviously uh, going back um, uh, for me doing something to to try and um, clean up the world's energy system um, 
uh, ha has been what I've what I've known I want to do since I was a teen. And and when I when I found that uh, um, there were things that I was able to do um, in China, um, then I just uh, started uh, learning the language because I, I figured that that's never going to go to waste. Now, this is already fascinating, by the way, because most people know you're a, you're a Greenpeace at the time. Most activists who are trying to improve the world, right? Most of the emissions, all of the emissions growth happens not in the developed world, but in the developing world. But most of them decide that it's much easier to go after Shell or to glue yourself to the road in Amsterdam or whatever. Very few of them make the career choice that you did, which is to learn Chinese and go to Beijing to have the most impact where the import where the impact is right well i think it's healthy that most people working um uh, in those geographies are are local people and i have the privilege of course to to speak to and get to know and, and follow the work of of uh, amazing people working in china india indonesia and and uh, um so on so i, I was at a global in a global role at a time and, and it's just something that uh, that i found um i was uh, i was able to do and you also, um, you've also lived in Indonesia and speak the language. That's right. So you've done this multiple times, right? Uh, yeah, I, I did spend quite some time going from one country to the next, picking up a few languages now, and, a, and a bit of understanding of those places. Now, if you go back to uh, 2011, isn't that the time in Beijing where the US embassy, they put an air quality monitor on the roof? And it was outputting the air quality and it got so bad, the programmer had said when it gets to a thousand, just write something like, you know, geez, this is crazy bad. And so suddenly you had this monitor that was saying, this is crazy bad, crazy bad. And, uh, and it caused a bit of a diplomatic incident. Isn't it those times that you were based in Beijing? Absolutely. So, so um, that's the time that um, the debate about air pollution reached uh, um, a, a very high um, level and, and scale in China. It was uh, a time that uh, um, social media, um, academia and so on were about as, as open, as, as free as they have been in, in China's recent history. And uh, there started to be a middle class that started to think about uh, quality of life, health, um, uh, especially the, the quality of life and health, health of their children and so on. So um, all of that uh, combined to turn air pollution as a massive issue. Uh, the the U.S. embassy played an important role, exactly because not so much because they they were putting out data that was different from the gov government, but because they were applying different labels to the data. So it was really the discrepancy between um, uh, the the government uh, saying that it's uh, lightly polluted, and uh, and uh, the the uh, U.S. embassy applying the U.S label which would be hazardous or then they when they ran out of labels uh, crazy bad or beyond index as you said and there was also of course the um the beijing olympics which was uh, which focused a lot of international attention and also presumably domestic attention on the air quality issue absolutely and so there was a, um there was a big drive uh, by the local government the beijing government uh, to improve air quality in the run up to the olympics there was something that helped a bit, which was the global financial crisis just before the Olympics, which caused uh, um, coal consumption and uh, energy consumption to drop. Because um, this was 2016, wasn't it? The the, the uh, Summer Olympics were uh, 2008. Uh, 2008. And then the winter. And, uh, yeah. And so then what happened afterwards, after the Olympics, was uh, uh, the steel industry from Beijing, that used to be based in Beijing, was relocated relocated to the next province um, across um, 300, 500 kilometers away. But in the following decade, it grew up to, to be so big that the pollution was still traveling back to Beijing uh, from, from the, those uh, steel plants. And, and highlighting that and highlighting that uh, uh, long range contribution of, of those uh, um, uh, steel plants and other coal burning plants was a big part of uh, what I uh, was focused on in China to make that a part of the debate. Now, the question of air quality. So your NGO, which you're now running, is the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air. To what extent are you using clean air as the sort of salient issue really to drive climate action? Uh, the way I, I want to think about it is, is uh, we're looking at those 
areas where there's a synergy. Um, so uh, there are things that eminently make sense to do uh, to clean up the air, but they also um, help with climate. And there's no shortage of those things, obviously, because uh, uh, fossil fuels and uh, deforestation are the two main drivers of, of both of those two things. So you're in Beijing, you're reading data from all sorts of places, the U.S. Embassy, the Chinese government air quality um, indices, output data, also electricity, also coal consumption, imports, the whole lot. And I discovered you around, I think it was 2015. I just, um, yesterday I was watching uh, myself, um, not that I'm vain, speaking at a New Energy Finance Summit, Bloomberg New Energy Finance Summit in 2016. Um, the reason I was watching is I, tried, I was trying to track back when I first sort of realized what you were doing in terms of uh, data and the sources you were using. And what was happening at that point was the Chinese government was still saying they were going to grow at something like 8%, but electricity growth had dropped to zero. And I was stood up in front of hundreds of people and said, you need to understand the electricity data, which I was getting actually from you, shows that those official GDP statistics must be wrong. So where were you getting your data from? Well, electricity data, obviously, is, is uh, uh, very easy to come by. Um, it was uh, really finding ways to um, uh, to analyze it and, and may, uh, spending time um, analyzing it. Um, I, I think the problem with uh, China and uh, the world, frankly, is that there's there's just so much data and so few people trying to make sense of it, uh, doing any kind of analysis beyond calculating year-on-year -year, uh, changes. Um, and so, just as you said, there there are and there were weekly surveys of uh, steel industry operation. There uh, there are, of course, the prices of everything. Um, there is uh, uh, monthly um, industry statistics and, and so on. So, there's just so much data to work with. The, the funny... Um, our challenging thing about China is that uh, that so many of those data sets do have their own distortions because there's always a target or a quota to hit for everything and uh, um, and so on. So it's it's a matter of making trying to make sense of uh, which data set is biased in what which direction and uh, which ones you can actually uh, trust that at at that given moment uh, to give an accurate picture. And another thing that helps a lot is just speaking with people in, in 2015, if you spoke to anyone who is in business, manufacturing anything in China, you would get a, a story that, that made it very clear that uh, that, that the economic uh, slump, especially the, the slump in the construction sector, was, was much worse uh, than the government was, uh, uh, was making it out to be. But were you not astonished that there were these enormous hedge funds, enormous banks, you know, governments making policy, and they just didn't seem to have the quality of data that that you could find and you were just aggregating from all these different sources locally. The, it, the data was available. Why were you the only person pulling it together? I think we got lucky in the sense that we were working on this from the air quality side. And that's one of the factors that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, people who were in, in finance were overlooking. So they were not used to, before that point in time, to, to um, air quality policies uh, being something that could drive uh, the global commodity markets. And so that was the first thing that, uh, that we picked up on. And, and obviously after that, uh, um, a lot of people have, have uh, paid uh, very close attention to, for example, steel mill closures um, in China. Uh, the other thing that a lot of people were missing, um, if you were looking at things from um, uh, from the, from the conventional um, uh, frame for for commodity analysts was uh, was the war on corruption, uh, which was uh, affecting a lot of infrastructure projects and all kinds of uh, construction projects in China because suddenly every bureaucrat was uh, was worried about uh, uh, granting permits to those projects if there was uh, a bit of uh, shady money involved. So, and when you say um, that th this affects commodity markets, around that time, I re remember talking to Australians uh, and saying, look, you know, China's undergoing this incredible slowdown. 
your coal, which is for China, it's your exports, which is China's imports, is going to be the first to suffer because clearly they're going to buy us towards using their own resources. I know there are some quality uh, differences, but nevertheless, China is going to buy us towards using its own coal. There's a slowdown. This is going to hurt. And their attitude was first, well, you know, that's not what our statistics show. And they were wrong. And then, of course, they jumped to saying, well, never mind, because we'll just sell to India because India is growing. Um, so, you know, getting to the bottom of these really granular data sets is kind of important, right? Uh, absolutely. And and so the same thing happened with uh, uh, with Australia's uh, um, belief in LNG markets more recently. Um, so I've, I've uh, for the past couple of uh, few years, since 2019, I've been telling people that, that China's uh, gas demand isn't going to be what it used to be because of energy security uh, policies. And that's panned out quite well. Funnily enough, uh, China's uh, steel mi coal mining industry is, is in quite a bit of trouble. And uh, that has led to a resurgence in, in coal imports more recently. But you're right that, uh, that there was uh, a big drop off uh, in, uh, starting from 2014. Uh, that uh, um, uh, a lot of people people got burned who were banking on on growth in China's demand. I mean, I have to just kind of take a time out to ask you, why do you still work for an NGO? I mean, this sort of knowledge, look, that gas miscalling China's gas demand cost tens of billions of dollars. This is a fantastic sort of hedge fund play. That's the sort of knowledge that these financial operators live and die by, and you've got it and you just publish it. I care about uh, uh, making a difference. And, uh, and so that the, this is the best way that I've, uh, I've found um, of doing that. That's a great answer. Um, so that's the end of my, you know, sort of my, my probing your personal motivations, I guess. Um, now, let's go back to that, because what happened then was there was this dramatic slowdown, which you spotted, frankly, you know, first and better than anybody I know. Uh, but then there was also there's been a number of different cycles since then, including um, 2016. You started to say China's coming roaring back in terms of coal demand, in terms of emissions, in terms of the economy. Um, and, and that, again, you were ahead of that, I think. But then we went into the COVID years, right? 2020. Talk us through what happened next. Uh, so uh, China obviously uh, implemented a very dramatic and strict uh, um, COVID lockdown in, in early 2020. Um, there was uh, a steep drop in, um, in uh, industrial output, electricity demand, and so on. Um, even at its deepest point, it wasn't as deep as it seemed to people on the ground. So, so for example, there were air, air pollution episodes in Beijing where people were going, what's going on? Uh, there's no, nothing that, where this pollution could be coming wrong from. Uh, from so uh, so uh, somehow we must have gotten now um, sources of air pollution completely wrong. But that that wasn't right. So so a lot of the heavy industry just kept uh, running through it. And uh, the government made sure that uh, the demand for um, for um, those heavy industry products uh, just picked up in the second half of the year. And so, in fact, um, in aggregate, what happened was that China's CO2 emission growth accelerated during the zero COVID period compared with uh, what it was um, up to 2019. Um, so China was the only country... Uh, to increase its emissions uh, through that period, and they are still above uh, the trend line uh, the, where we would have, would have expected them to be uh, before COVID. So, so it was a, a pattern of, of incredibly energy intensive and carbon intensive growth, even even while uh, GDP growth rates were uh, surprising or disappointing. Because I remember a time when, um, uh, during the, the, I guess it's 2020, where the government was saying, no, no, we're going to continue to grow 6%, it's going to be 6%. And that was, that was sort of impossible. If you looked at what happened Q1, Q2, 2020, there was no way you could, you'd have had to grow 11, 12% year on year for the second half of the year to do that. So I was sort of out there saying, excuse me, these, this GDP growth is nonsense. 
But what you were doing was probably that, but also saying, but from the air quality data, we know that the primary industry must be continuing. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, so in fact, for 2020, uh, China's reported GDP growth rate was just two uh, percent, I think. But so uh, very, uh, very low. It was the uh, the uh, uh, well, a lot of people obviously were saying and and uh, are are still saying for good for a good reason that it probably in reality was less than two percent. Um, so that, uh, but uh, be it as it may, that was uh, that was still um, a slowdown. Um, what's happened since then is that uh, um, this year um, the uh, recovery in um, in economic growth has has uh, disappointed. Um, people were expecting or hoping, I guess, um, that private consumption would pick up um, after after the reopening. Of the economy and so on, that just hasn't panned out for reasons that are at least in re retrospect quite obvious. People's incomes and so on were hit uh, quite severely. Um, what now, though, a lot of people are doubting the five percent growth that that uh, uh, China just uh, reported, precisely because of the fact that uh, a lot of the traditional uh, growth drivers, especially real estate, also private consumption. Um, are are in a very bad shape. What we've been looking at that explains that discrepancy is that there has been a massive um, uh, growth uh, um, impulse coming from uh, clean energy sectors. So uh, a, an incredible wave of investment in a battery, yeah. solar, EV, and, and so on, manufacturing and uh, deployment that uh, is in fact the, the largest single contributor um, to um, GDP growth last year. Let, let's just get back to that in one second. I want to I want to dive in on that clearly, um, but I just want to make sure that I've understood and that our uh, audience is following. So, in the the West, in the OECD countries, um, what you saw was COVID stimulus going towards mainly well the people to the consumption, and you know what we then had was of course that the middle classes who had done work from home, they didn't lose their jobs, they worked from home. So they were still earning, but they couldn't spend money on holidays and restaurants and DIY, you couldn't have workmen in and so on. And so there was this pent up um, household savings plus the stimulus which went to consumption. And then you saw this enormous boom and you couldn't get waiters and you couldn't get drivers and so on coming out of it. What you're saying is that China did something very different. It kept its primary industries going and then stimulus went into coming out of COVID. Presumably, that's why we saw uh, this kind of stimulus going into more construction, more capex, and now we've got this sort of the, the now we've got the the um, uh, we've got we've got the hangover. Now there's now the problems are, uh, are hitting those sectors. Is that a fair characterization? And then you're saying the only one that has kind of stopped that from being catastrophic is the clean energy sector. Am I? Is that a a, a fair summary you know it's it's very good to summarize and, and that's exactly right so the short uh, short of it is that everyone else in the world not just the west um supported uh consumers supported uh consumer incomes whereas uh, what china did was they cut taxes on businesses they cut expenses like electricity prices and and everything else um and uh and also um let businesses um cut people's uh uh, incomes. Um, uh, so, uh, the exact opposite uh, of of what the the rest of the world did, uh, supporting the supply side, and and you can see that in trade balances. China had an incredible export boom uh, during COVID. Everyone else was importing um, uh, from China. That was PPE, personal protective equipment, but also everything else, right? Uh, yeah, everything yeah. that people spent on on during yeah. during COVID. So, so now you have this kind of hangover hitting those kind of capital intensive primary industry construction. I mean, you know, the, the, the sort of mainstream narrative is that China is now faltering. China has misallocated resources and it's going to get ugly and there's bad debt. And what you're saying, though, is that the clean energy sector is actually now propping up or is the, is the growth sector and is actually the only one that's accounting for this um, supposed 5% growth. Uh, that that's the case at least for 2023. So, 
if you look at the growth in fixed asset investment, which is a huge part of China's um, economy, um, all of the growth came from investment in clean energy sectors, uh, broadly understood, everything um, else in aggregate uh, fell. How, how do you square this narrative? And by the way, you know, the extraordinary growth in Chinese wind, solar, uh, EVs, domestically and export. I mean, that, that I think the, our audience would recognize that as being the case. These kind of 90% market share plus in the supply chain, huge installations uh, across clean energy. Just how can you square that, that story about the kind of the, 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 the waves during COVID? How do you square it with the fact that we were getting stories about the traffic lights not working because there was no electricity? I mean, if they were, you know, focusing on the stimulus from private, uh, from, from, from primary industries, why wasn't there enough electricity? That was a result of the government's uh, supply side policies. So what they did is uh, uh, they had a drive to, to push down electricity costs uh, to businesses exactly to stimulate growth. And then when global fuel prices showed up, when, when Russia started throttling uh, gas exports to, to Europe in, in the second half of 2022, um, then uh, uh, coal-fired power plants um, were not able to make money. They were not able to even recoup their fuel, fuel costs um, from, from generation, uh, from the electric, electricity prices that they were getting. And so a lot of coal plants would started calling in sick. They, were, they started saying that they have a technical malfunction or, oops, we ran out of fuel and uh, stopped generating. And, and that created um, what I, I would call an artificial shortage of uh, um, electricity. Now... What's fascinating is a lot of people perhaps listening to this would say, you know, China is playing on the transition an absolute blinder. You know, China owns the supply chains. China is installing this. And you need to be essentially a sort of, if not a, if not a dictatorship, then at least a centrally planned economy to navigate the net zero transition. But, you know, when you, you know, when you listen to that story about power stations calling in sick, you call it, you know, pretending to have a malfunction because they're not allowed to sell because the government set price for electricity is too low to allow them to buy coal. Um, isn't this uh, the flip side of the coin? And actually, it's in a way, it's a, a, a bigger problem that it's about misallocation of resources. A lot of this story that you've just told about China is misallocation of resources, overinvestment in real estate, overinvestment in primary industries, not being able then um, during the years that that, um, uh, uh, that that Premier Xi tried to move to consumption, essentially a failure, and then mispricing electricity. Uh, I mean, this is this is a mismanagement. This is not great management, is it? Well, the polite way to put it is that China has a, an extremely high tolerance for for risk taking and and uh, also for uh, misallocation, for better or worse, which does make them. Um, very good at industrial policy. So when you decide to go after something, um, uh, you can you can do it at a scale that is extremely hard for anyone else uh, to match. But then, of course, uh, uh, there there are a lot of uh, um, issues in China. So, for example, the fact that they're um, still work, uh, building a lot of coal-fired power plants that is solely because of uh, uh, of uh, um, an outdated uh, grid m management model and an outdated uh, electricity um, system model that doesn't ma make uh, um, efficient use of uh, existing um, capacity. Um, so, yes, there are there are both uh, 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 both uh, downsides and upsides to uh, to to uh, uh, China's way of of doing this. I, I would say that uh, uh, the way that uh, that China's financial system and uh, governing system is set up makes them very good at at industrial policy but uh but but risks uh creating big issues for uh for economic policy and economic growth going forward so let's come back to the the question of trying to sort of keep electricity prices low which backfires we're going to talk about again when we come to south africa uh, but i want to talk about those that huge surging investment that china's got in coal-fired power stations i mean put it in perspective in terms of who's building coal-fired power stations today um out of if you look at new projects uh going into construction getting permitted and so on 
uh, more than eight, more, more than eighty eighty percent of those um, are in China, which is of course uh, uh, remarkable, um, given that there are a lot of countries in the world that do need more um, electricity and uh, um, and are investing in uh, power generation. They're just not uh, not choosing to invest um, in coal. So you've got countries like Vietnam, Thailand, Bangladesh. India, uh, also some of the Latin American countries. So you've got people with enormous amounts of reserves of coal and they are not exploiting them. They are not building coal-fired power stations. But China, 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 China is. Why is that? So India is still uh, building a few. It's largely politically driven uh, projects. Uh, private developers exited quite a while ago. Uh, but overall, um, it's just, just the... Uh, uh, Financial uh, financials just don't um, stack up uh, because of uh, of the high capital costs, uh, um, uncertainty about fuel prices, uh, competition from uh, low cost uh, renewables. I think it's anyone anyone who's following the energy sector can can list the reasons why coal is not happening outside of uh, uh, China. Um, in in China, though, uh, there are are two things. One of them is uh, uh, the government. Uh, is providing a lot of investment security, so um, they they can basically make anyone whole by regulating electricity prices, introducing a capacity payment that uh, like they just did, um, or simply um, telling the banks uh, to eat the losses if if the projects uh, don't um, uh, work out. Uh, the other factor is that uh, building a coal-fired power plant in China is incredibly cheap compared with anywhere else in the world. So um, all kinds of, uh, China obviously has, has uh, a huge, uh, has huge economies of scale, uh, which drive costs down, um, and also uh, massive structural subsidies for um, all kinds of, of heavy industry and construction, which makes it uh, affordable. So the economics of a, of a coal plant in China are much closer to the economics of a, of a gas turbine in the West. I just am surprised that it's so much more profitable, if that's the argument, that it's more profitable in China than in, for instance, India or Vietnam, where you could also build these things very cheaply and they've got the coal supplies. So it must be because it's effectively being promoted by the political system, not just the economics. I mean, it must it's, be. There's no other real explanation, surely. It's, it's, yeah, it's borderline profitable at best. Coal plants have been losing money most of the recent years. Last year, they managed to make a bit of money, but still something not enough to justify anywhere near the kind of investment that we're seeing. The, the average utilization rate is at, at 50% and uh, profit margin are, are thin at best. So can you talk us through, because of course, China is not monolithic in its decision making. You've got central government, you've got the provinces, you have the coal uh, industry, which is a, has its own agency, I mean, its own uh, decision making, that, it, that uh, its own goals that it pursues. You've got the electrical system. Similarly, you've got then the customers. Who is actually pushing for coal and is anybody pushing back? Uh, the energy regulators in the central government have been pushing quite strongly for coal. Um, the provincial Chinese provinces basically have a big preference uh, for any kind of big infrastructure and construction projects, whatever um, uh, variety. Um, so they they will grab any opportunity whenever there is a um, a central government policy that allows or promotes something. They're going to jump onto it. Um, the people that I was hoping would push back are uh, financial regulators. So uh, the um, uh, state-owned enterprise watch watchdog, uh, SASAC, and uh, the financial ministry, because they are, those, they are the people who should care about uh, return on assets, uh, who should care about the profitability of state-owned uh, enterprises. However, after the electricity shortages that we saw over the past couple of years, um, the way I look at it is, is uh, um, any uh, no local or, or central decision maker is going to stop any coal plant after those simply because you're afraid of getting blamed for 
um, electricity shortages in the future, there was a, a very, um, a, a very strong emphasis on ensuring electricity supply, and and one issue is that uh, um, that local decision makers cannot fix the electricity system. So for them, the only way to keep the lights on is to build more capacity. And and if the central government doesn't send a clear message that they are going to move ahead with the kinds of reforms that would be needed to make uh, make the electricity system flexible and and efficient, then as a local decision maker, you just don't um, have other ways of of uh, managing it. Yes, I suspect that that would be a big part of it. So there's a, an episode in my background where I worked on perestroika. Uh, the reforms to the Soviet economy, which of course proved to be largely impossible. And um, the the problem there was that if your five-year plan said you made this many aircraft, you absolutely needed to get that much aluminium, and that meant that much bauxite, and you backward integrated because it was the only way that you could deliver your five-year plan. And so I, I, I suspect with the provinces, there's a similar thing. You're under pressure, huge pressure for economic growth, but you don't want to rely on a political rival in a different province for your power. That's that's a huge part of it. So, uh, and that's the, when I when I talk about flexibility or efficient uh, operation of the electricity system, the the main issue is that power isn't being dispatched across province boundaries. So, um, all of the electricity shortage episodes that there have been in China in recent years, if you look at the capacity that would have been available at the next province across, there would not have been an electricity shortage. And you, uh, if you read news stories, uh, the, the officials are describing things like making emergency phone calls uh, to, uh, to generators to arrange electricity supply, which is <laughs> not exactly how things work uh, uh, on a um, uh, on a well-developed uh, electricity market, um, so uh, so it's it's a very rigid rigid system and one where um, dispatch across provinces um, isn't working. And when you have uh, thirty uh, provinces, if e- each one of them plants their uh, capacity as if they were an island, you end up with a lot of redundant capacity. So let's move on. I promised a flyby of the different uh, regions and countries that you cover. Uh, We won't be able to cover them all. But another one that has got a lot of this kind of dispatch uh, challenges and uh, misallocation of resources is South Africa. Um, What spurred me to reach out and invite you to come on to this uh, uh, episode of Cleaning Up was that you commented on the fact that South Africa famously has got these um, rolling blackouts, rolling power cuts. And... Most people would say they haven't built enough capacity. I mean, they've also had these incredible problems with um, these two huge coal-fired power stations, uh, Medupe and uh, what's it, what are they called? Um, Medupe and Kusile. Medupe and Kusile, uh, which, by the way, I tried my hardest when I was a complete unknown to say they ought to be investing in renewables and not doing them. So I feel very vindicated. But they've got your your theory is or your analysis shows that the issue isn't just building more capacity. Tell us why. Absolutely. So exactly the same thing that I mentioned with uh, uh, China. When you look at uh, the peak load in the system, the <clears throat> maximum amount that uh, that would be needed at each moment, that's way below um, the, the amount of capacity that is available. Um, so... Uh, South Africa has at least nominally 44 gigawatts of coal-fired capacity, plus another um, almost 10 gigawatts of other controllable capacity like nuclear nuclear and hydropower. And uh, their maximum peak load is well below 40 gigawatts. So that should be a very comfortable system to manage. The problem is that they have too much capacity, and uh, that capacity just keeps breaking down. Um, the maintenance uh, is being uh, neglect- neglected um, left and right, and and it's just developed into a point where you have a um, have a very high tolerance for failure. So even even those uh, new coal-fired power plants, Medu- Medupe and uh, Kusile, 
they've been breaking down. They've uh, so uh, Kusila just uh, had a breakdown. They're obviously delayed uh, by by many many years. Uh, in the case of uh, Medupi, um, there was a specific condition from the World Bank to uh, to install um, sulfur dioxide control devices in the plant, and then halfway through the project, um, the the state-owned uh, power utility said, "Oops, sorry, we're not going to do that because it costs money," and uh, and so on. So. Uh, so there is just uh, um, a very chronic issue of, of uh, underinvestment in maintaining the existing capacity and, and extremely high tolerance for failure because you're used to having way too much capacity. So you have too much capacity that presumably drives down prices. So nobody makes any money. So therefore you don't do your maintenance. But on top of that, there's fraud and corruption and a bunch of other things going on is there not so why did why did Kusile break apparently it was to do with coal quality so the wrong quality of coal beer. these are very sensitive plants they're hyper super critical the most complex the most efficient the most this the most that um and then if you don't get the right quality of coal is that is that what happened or is that just what i heard and it kind of fits my priors and sounds and has truthiness is that is that what you uh what you uh, your analysis shows for for Kusile, it, it was engineering issues, so the duct work uh, failed. But there are other plants where, um, so there was um, um, a seam in place uh, where where the plants um, got shipped sub substandard quality coal, and the better quality coal got exported, and and so then um, former Escom employees were in on the take when the and and when the plants. We're receiving um, uh, the the shipments of the coal. No one just uh, uh, raised any alarm. They just dutifully um, uh, um, sent uh, the coal into the boilers and broke the plants. So this is the kind of uh, um, and, and when the plants broke, no one really raised an alarm either because it's normal for Escom plants to break. So this is what I uh, mean when I say that yeah. uh, that uh, there's just an extremely high tolerance um, for plants not being uh, available you know when when it happens in in Texas or whatnot that plants are not available at a critical moment it takes uh, uh, there's at least a very serious look into uh, what happened who's to blame and so on but it, none of that is just just happening and the issue of um, the sulfur scrubbers that were not installed there's this extraordinary statistic isn't there that South Africa's sulfur uh, dioxide pollution is the worst in the world, or what's the statistic? Uh, so ESCOM, as the operator, is the largest power sector emitter um, of uh, sulfur dioxide. And if you consider that uh, um, that uh, they've got um, uh, 40 gigawatts of coal, whereas China has 1,000, then emitting more from these 40 gigawatts than China's more than 1,000 1, gigawatts is, is quite an accomplishment. Um, there are some other countries like India that emit even slightly more, but uh, but there is no it, no company in the in the world that emits more from power plants. So, ESCOM, a single company, South Africa, emitting more sulfur dioxide than China. Than China's power plants. Yeah, absolutely extraordinary. Um, let's move on to um, let, let's let's talk about Indonesia because you know this sort of I guess the theme that's emerging. I don't want to lead you too much, but the theme that's emerging is badly structured markets and governance rather than just more capacity. More capacity is not going to solve that problem. Um, China is actually doing more capacity in clean energy, but it still hasn't solved its coal problem. What's happening in uh, in, in Indonesia, Jakarta, um, the air quality? How are we doing there? Um, Jakarta just had a very um, nasty um, dry season. Um, last year, um, and uh, that that raised air um, air pollution um, into a major public issue. Uh, we were we were doing a lot of analysis of that, uh, the sources, the trends, um, and and uh, uh, so on. And uh, it it in fact uh, got uh, uh, quite controversial. So what we were doing is we were pointing to coal-fired power plants and other far away emitters. 
uh, that are contributing to, to Jakarta's pollution, and that turned out to be uh, politically inconvenient uh, for some people. So we had to endure uh, pretty um, uh, nasty public attacks because of that. But I'm I'm very happy that we're um, doing um, that work in terms of coal-fired power plants. Indonesia's seen a huge um, surge in in coal power capacity, and they've uh, in fact managed to get into a situation where they've uh, um, they have overcapacity of coal-fired power, and and most importantly, um, a lot of that coal-fired power has been contracted on take or pay, pay terms. So those coal plants must be run at a high utilization rate, which then uh, means that there's uh, uh, there's uh, no space to um, to add renewables um, into the grid. Uh, which, which of, of course, uh, the country would be good for the country to do um, otherwise. They are also also um, they they also cross subsidize coal for domestic consumption by requiring coal exporters to sell at a lower regulated price uh, to domestic users. I'm all for um, the country getting more value out of its commodity exports, but um, doing that as a cross subsidy to coal rather than um, putting money into a fund that you can use to build clean energy, for example, is of course uh, introduces a massive bias uh, for coal. So the um, what what you've got then is a um, is that a you the a state utility is that a monopoly? That would be um, PLN, is that right? Yeah. So they have a, a they have no incentive on, on to build renewables. Exactly. They have no incentive to to introduce renewables or to let anybody else. Exactly. Uh, so, so uh, what BLN has to do is they have to make money from the main um, power grid that covers Java, Bali, and and South Sumatra, because they're forced to sell at a loss on the other islands. And so, if they have uh, uh, and uh, so on on the main island, installing solar or other renewables would be economically very attractive yep. because of of the regulated prices. But if that starts to happen, then BLN starts to lose market share on their cash cow cow market, and then they can't uh, fund the rest of their operation. So that's that's the trap. Now, now both um, South Africa and Indonesia um, entered into these partnerships post the Glasgow COP, uh, COP 26, 2021. They were called JETPs, the Joint uh, Energy Transition Partnerships. And both of those are in trouble. Uh, both of those, it's been very difficult to kind of, the, the idea was you do a transition and our investors with a bit of help from our public funds will provide the money. Both of those have been in trouble. I mean, is it around these issues like the monopoly, uh, either, you know, ESCOM and its governance or in Indonesia's case, um, the the way that um, the monopoly utility is regulated? Uh, yeah, in both both cases, it's really the politics around closing down coal plants that has uh, proved uh, very very tricky. So in um, Indonesia, um, they did land on a on an investment plan uh, for the JetP that uh, includes all kinds of no nice things, but essentially uh, no commitments to close down um, coal fired power plants. Uh, they do have a commitment to to do about ten gigawatts of uh, of uh, uh, solar, uh, which if that happens is at least may means breaking down some of the barriers for that. Uh, but uh, uh, but so the whole uh, the the political economy and the strong interests around the existing um, uh, coal plants just didn't get uh, uh, get broken by this. Um, for Indonesia, the the really big sticking point was that um, they wanted to only look at uh, grid-connected coal-fired power plants. And there has been a parallel boom in coal plants on the outer, outer islands to power uh, smelters, especially nickel smelters. Nickel and, smelters. Exactly. And so yeah. uh, when people started to, and, and we started to look at the, uh, the numbers, the CO2 emissions from those captive power plants, it just uh, became clear that, mm. that if you include them, uh, there was no way that Indonesia was go uh, going to live up to what they promised um, they would target um, as a part of the 
uh, the JetP. Um, for for South Africa, uh, similarly, it's been so it's been two issues. One of them is um, ESCOM is in a political trap where um, closing down the plants is politically very hard. There's opposition from uh, from unions and and uh, coal interests, uh, but also because they can't can't seem to get any of the plants fixed, they're just uh, stuck with uh, uh, with way too many plants that get uh, keep uh, breaking down, and then it always seems that that you can't afford to close down a single plant. And then when you can't close down a single plant, you can't afford to get all of them fixed. So um, so that's uh, that's the trap uh, that they are in. And, and that's why um, the, uh, the coal retirement part of it um, hasn't been coming through. There's one plant that has been committed for closure, but uh, all the other ones around it seem to be getting delayed in their retirement again. So what's so interesting is in the COP discussions, there are these endless discussions about are we phasing down, phasing out, transitioning away from fossil fuels? And I think a lot of people, um, particularly in the in, in the developed world uh, in the West, would say, oh, that's all about oil. It's all about the oil companies. It's all about, you know, Adnoc and Sultan al Jaba, And it's all about uh, the Saudi Arabians and they're you know, doing their market stimulation. They were caught stimulating the markets in Asia and so on. But it actually, in terms of the vast amounts of emissions that come out of coal-fired power stations still, it's not enough just to do renewables on top. We've actually got to, we don't care what it, it doesn't matter what it's called, phasing down, out or transitioning. But unless you're fundamentally prepared to shut coal-fired power stations in countries like Indonesia, um, uh, South Africa, we, there is no transition, really. There's just a, a bit of new clean energy on top. Is that the same discussion in India? Um, I'd, I'll just say in general that uh, um, I think in in South Africa, um, the only way that this is going to play out is that more and more people vote with their feet and, and just stop buying um, from ESCOM. So they're just uh, choosing a path where, where they're going to get uh, uh, redundant themselves. And uh, so with Indonesia, the ability of, of uh, BLN to block solar has hinged on um, on uh, they're blocking people from selling their excess power to the grid, and uh, that's why solar powered uh, projects don't make economic sense. But with what's happening with batteries now, I think uh, um, that's going to start happening um, a lot faster. That in fact, solar with batteries, basically off grid or partially off grid, uh, becomes profitable, and and that just forces PLN um, to start uh, uh, moving. But with, that feels like that will take longer. That will take longer than perhaps in South Africa, where you can find an alternative supply. Yeah, not necessarily. Uh, these these things uh, do happen. Mm. Um, usually, well, if if you look at what happened across the world in in response to um, uh, to the uh, spike in fuel prices, it was really those technologies that people can just go. And uh, by themselves, uh, like solar yeah. and EVs that spiked, whereas uh, wind and so on were struggling. So it might be, it, it's going to be um, uh, much messier, uh, certainly not a just transition for, for workers and all of those, but it can be a lot faster when it's driven by distributed technologies and, and the breakdown of, yeah. of uh, traditional utilities. Although that leaves the industry behind somewhat. So Lowry, I don't want to shortchange India. I am going to slightly shortchange India because I'm very keen to talk about the work you're doing in Russia, which is very different. But, you know, India is always launching these very ambitious uh, programs, uh, renewable energy, clean energy, also uh, potentially its own manufacturing, its uh, exporting made in India and so on. Uh, and it always seems to disappoint. Now, why is that? Um, so... When you're talking about mega projects, huge uh, um, centralized uh, renewables projects in in India, it's easy to see why they're hard to implement. There are uh, it, uh, it's a country with with a very dense population, obviously, lots of issues with uh, with uh, land ownership and so on. Um, so uh, land ac acquisition for those projects is hard and has to be hard because there are communities that are, that face the impacts if if it's done. Uh, wrong. Uh, I, get, I think the most important question is is why isn't distributed um, solar, especially happening faster um, in India, and uh, that goes back to electricity markets. So when you have uh, 
um, still have electricity theft. You have uh, um, uh, every every election cycle there are new promises of cheap or free electricity um, and so on. Uh, then that just means that uh, that there isn't an incentive um, to to provide a uh, full supply of of uh, electricity. So so again, it's uh, um, it's an issue of of having existing overcapacity as a result of that and uh, and not being able to recoup costs for new projects. So it, it feels like a political problem in that case, which is promised cheap electricity. And of course, you destroy then the incentive for people to invest. And I guess there's also still, uh, you know, there's been historically also um, sort of tariffs on imports, restrictions on who can lend and unwillingness to become dependent on uh, China's supply chain and all of these kind of almost geopolitical issues. Um, absolutely. And it's, it, well, it's not hard to understand why um, India wouldn't want to be reliant on Chinese um, supply, but then it, at, at least you have to make sure that the conditions are there um, to build a domestic uh, uh, manufacturing base. And nevertheless, there is a lot going on, is there not? Absolutely. It's just that uh, uh, India's electricity demand growth in the in the past uh, year or, or a few years has been absolutely blistering, and that just um, meant that uh, that the growth has still um, come from coal, unfortunately. So there's a long long way to go, and I think uh, the the only way to get to the the scale um, needed in in India is for a lot of a lot more of uh, the projects to happen. Uh, in on the distributed uh, solar side of things. And I do worry that the next 20 years, we might see both India and Africa doing what China did during the period sort of 1990 to 2010, this incredible growth. The good news is it will bring a lot of people out of poverty. The bad news is uh, if it's not clean growth, if it's not based on clean energy, nuclear renewables, and if it's not efficient, um, it's going to have horrible impacts on climate and air quality. Uh, what people tend to underappreciate is how incredibly energy intensive China's economic model has been. And so uh, there's, a, there's simply just isn't going to be another China unless Africa somehow switches to a continent-wide planned economy, which I don't think right. is going to happen. So, so uh, people, of course, talk about China's uh, dependence on coal, but the bigger piece of why China's per capita emissions have already overtaken the EU with one third of the GDP per capita is, is, is the economic model and, and the, the uh, um, huge bias for, for massive uh, projects and, and uh, construction that it brings. And exports. It's always extraordinary when you get people saying, oh, you know, the, the UK, Europe, US, we have to take responsibility for China's emissions because we import goods from them. But they're the ones that chose this incredible coal dependent, incredible sort of export driven growth model. We, we didn't force them to adopt that economic model. Um, but nevertheless, we're supposed to somehow be responsible for their emissions, which I always find uh, difficult. I do want to move on to Russia, though, because we're running out of time. And the work you've done there, you've been tracking, uh, you were working, you were operating in Ukraine, you were operating, I don't know, in Russia or, or tracking Russia's developments before uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But you kind of pivoted to tracking Russia's fossil fuel exports. Talk us through how that happened and what did you learn? Yeah, so we did uh, work on industrial emissions and uh, air pollution in Ukraine uh, before the invasion. Um, so uh, personally, the, the way it played out was uh, um, the day after um, the invasion started, when tanks were literally rolling towards uh, Kiev. Uh, we were having, uh, we were supposed to have a meeting with uh, um, uh, with our uh, Ukrainian partners, and I assumed that it's off. Uh, but just before, a bit before, um, they uh, they messaged us and, and uh, said that, you know what, we're just sitting in bomb shelters. There's nothing else for us to do, so why don't we just dial in and have a meeting? And, and then we started talking about what can we do in this situation to, to uh, uh, help Ukraine. And, uh, and uh, they said that uh, um, if you can uh, provide the, the data and the analytical basis for targeting Russia's fossil fuel exports. That's that's what you can do. 
uh, to help uh, help Ukraine survive in this situation. And and uh, so for me personally, I grew up very close to the Russian border. Um, uh, we uh, I have personal family history, like everyone in Finland, um, that that has to do with with uh, Russia's um, subjugation of of Finland and so on. So. So I, I felt very cl- strongly that this is something that I want to work on, and from an organizational perspective, this this conflict is so strongly enabled by fossil fuels and and Europe's dependence on fossil fuels that I f- felt that there is a case for our organization uh, to work on this as well. So so we took the money that we had for um, for working on industrial emissions in Ukraine and uh, use that to kickstart a project that uh, that provide it, provides a, a macro picture of uh, all of Russia's fossil fuel um, exports. And what did you find and what did you do with that? Are you feeding that into the kind of sanctions discussions or what did you, well, first talk us through what you found. Um, or what initially, you are, what you are what, indeed, what you are finding still, correct? Absolutely. So initially in the very beginning, we just started tallying how much money um, Russia made from exporting fossil fuels um, since the start of the invasion, and and started putting out those numbers because you know there are a lot of people in in the commodities sector and so on who are tracking specific flows like seaborne crude oil, but no one had the macro picture of of all the flows. So we put, started putting out those numbers, and uh, and and they got uh, covered extremely widely and helped uh, push. Um, for for sanctions on Russia's uh, fossil fuel exports, and then after that uh, initial phase of just just raising uh, that issue, uh, it's been more and more analyzing the uh, the effects of of different measures that have been taken. Where are the remaining loopholes? What is Russia doing to try and work around them? What can be done um, in response, um, and so on. And and so kind of the situation is that. Uh, that uh, um, oil imports into Europe have been banned uh, for the most part, but uh, European and UK shipping industry still continues to carry about half of all of Russia's uh, um, exports of uh, oil, when you include both oil products and and crude oil, which is just incredible that uh, we keep essentially ferrying money to Kremlin that they then use to build missiles and and uh, tanks and uh, and pay recruits to uh, to to attack us uh, attack Europe um, and and uh, the issue here is that uh, the enforcement um, of the price cap that is supposed to apply on Russia's uh, uh, fossil fuel ex- oil exports um, is not working and the the level of the price cap is way too high. So is it the level of the price cap, which I can't remember exactly what it is at the moment. So there is a price cap. Um, is it that it's too high uh, or is it that there are ways around it? You can pay so much officially and then you can have some other flow of commodities or goods that then remunerates uh, under the table, let's call it. Uh, it's it's both of them. But yeah, so so enforcement is not working. We've seen that, uh, uh, that uh, in the Pacific... Um, the the prices that are paid for Russian oil have consistently been above the price cap, which is at sixty dollars um, uh, for crude, um, and and still um, UK insured, uh, European insured ships have have uh, shown up in um, in uh, Eastern Russia uh, to to load the oil, um, and um, also in the Baltic and Black Sea, when prices have risen above the cap, uh, the, the tankers have have continued to show up. Um, so enforcement needs to be fixed. It's currently based on what is called attestations, which is a word, word that I'm, I'm be, if, I, if I'm being honest, I had to look up in the dictionary when this came up, but it just means a solemn promise, basically. And that's all that it is. And, and when you have shady traders outside of, of the jurisdiction of the, the sanctioning imposing countries who can issue these solemn promises, they are worth nothing um, at all. Um, so the uh, they, um, enforcement needs to be fixed. And... Uh, the the reason why the price cap hasn't been revised down uh, to a more meaningful level, I believe, is that that would would expose the fact that the enforcement is not working. So um, either one of those steps needs to be taken and and then followed up by the other. But how do you how does this 
in a sense, make you feel? Um, because, you know, on the one hand, we're supposed to be, you know, Ukraine is, is an ally. We are supporting it militarily. We're supporting it with aid, with humanitarian aid. Um, obviously, there is the issues with the, uh, this, uh, the, the horrendous rump of the Republican Party, the, the, the MAGA Republicans who are essentially working for Putin, we all know. But then the rest of us surely ought to be focused and this ought to get ought to be fixed. So how what do you what do you how do you feel when you see that it's not being fixed? It's, of course, been incredibly frustrating and still, it you know, the measures as an aggregate have had an impact. So Russia's uh, uh, fossil fuel revenues have have come down um uh, massively um from from their peak um so it's it's not all in vain but it's just clear that there's so much more that that could be done i think a big part of this is that uh, uh that uh, there was this moral clarity uh when it was fossil fuels literally physically coming into europe that were the main issue that it was a lot harder to get minds focused on that whereas now when it's uh it's uh, fossil fuels going to to China, India, Turkey, uh, and and it's the shipping part. Um, then it gets uh, right. gets more technical and and um, harder to uh, harder to get public public focus um, on it. But if it's our insurance, our own ships enabling that trade, then that's pretty morally clear. But we also still have fossil fuels coming into Europe. So OMV refuses to countenance not uh, buying and paying for gas uh, contracts that it's entered into before the conflict, which it could easily um, it could easily escape from with a bit of help from the EU and from its own government, uh, and yet they refuse to do so. Absolutely. So there's also there's a lot of um, LNG coming from Russian Arctic to Europe. Europe is still the biggest buyer of, of Russian um, LNG even overall. So, so that needs to be addressed. That's that's uh, an area where there seems to be some um, momentum. Um, and uh, uh, another issue that we've highlighted um, uh, for uh, for quite a while is that uh, it's still perfectly legal to refine Russian crude oil in third countries and then export those products um, uh, to Europe, to the UK, um, and and so on. Uh, there's even uh, refinery in in China that gets uh, crude oil directly by pipeline um, from uh, uh, from Russia, and uh, that can go to um, to these markets. So, so you, uh, yeah, there is still Russian crude oil um, coming coming to Europe, and and that needs to be banned, obviously. I have to say, listening to this, it's hardly surprising that Mr. Putin thinks he can outlast the will of the West to actually um, support Ukraine. Uh, to push back and to uh, to reverse his invasion, because you know if we're not doing it now, maybe in year t three, four, five of the conflict, we'll get serious about this stuff. I I will say that um, I want to thank you for the time you spent you know with us. It resonates in lots of ways. There's a number of themes there. Uh, for me personally, it's this idea that using data you can affect change. You don't have to be a huge advocate. You don't have to be gluing yourselves to things and protesting and, and uh, campaigning, uh, you know, your background was that originally, but the fact that you're using data, that resonates because I don't see myself in any way as an activist for clean energy or for the transition, but it so happens that by providing information and data, I think I and yourself as well, you know, I think we have accelerated some of these very, very important and critical trends. So um, I, I, that's how I, you know, that's what I, one of my takeaways uh, has been that. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. It's uh, by providing data and evidence to people who use it to drive change. Uh, that, that's one way of, uh, um, of uh, changing the balance of power. So thank you very, very much for uh, coming on Cleaning Up. It's been an enormous pleasure and very insightful speaking with you, Larry. Thank you so much, Michael. So that was Lauri Milivirta, co-founder and lead analyst at the Centre for Research on Energy and Clean Air, CREA, in Helsinki, and one of the world's preeminent experts on energy and emissions in emerging markets and Russia. As usual, we'll put links in the show notes to resources that were mentioned or might be of use. In this case, CREA's website and recent reports on Russian fossil fuel exports, 
and energy and air quality trends in the other countries they cover. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please remember to like, share and subscribe to Cleaning Up or leave us a review on your favourite podcast platform. And do please spread the word. Tell your friends and colleagues. And if you want more from Cleaning Up, sign up for our free newsletter on the publishing platform Substack at mlcleaningup.substack.com. That's mlcleaningup.substack.com or visit us on cleaningup.live. That's cleaningup.live.